calling the meeting of the Board of Health for June 11, 2020 to order. Um, oh, you guys hear me? Yep. Sorry. I am having my own personal technical difficulties, but we're good. Um, I, w I w first begin by asking for a motion to approve the conduct of meetings by electronic means. There are Dr. Ms. Essington has motion has motion to approve this meeting by electronic means. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Franklin, um, I will. Mr. Frederick, I will go to roll call. Yes. Ms. Essington. Yes. Ms. Franklin. Yes. Um, Dr. Johnson. I saw you yes. say yes. Um, and Dr. Campbell. Yes. Great. That movie carries. So, uh, thank you. Now, um, before we approve minutes, um, I would like to turn the floor to Vice Chair um, Franklin for a statement. Thank you, uh, Given the conversations over the last couple of weeks, um, and actually months and years, um, we're, we're at an apex and how we talk about race and understand how race impacts our lives. And I see this very clearly in the public health community. And so I, I want to offer a few comments and reflections, um, particularly about the intersection of public health and race, because our workforce balances that daily. Over the last week, I had an opportunity to speak with team members that were both black and white here at the health department. A black team member that I spoke with demonstrated the frustration, fatigue, and anger of black people dealing that black people deal with day in and day out regarding race. We talked about microaggressions, macroaggressions, implicit bias, stereotype threat, and racial anxiety. We talked about how we deal with this daily as black individuals. We spoke about the fear that we have for our black children as they embark in the world. We spoke about the difficulty of being in the type of work where you cannot take a break from conversations about race. Because if we do, then our communities will continue to struggle. There is reticence on black people in the department gathering to support each other because of the concern of this not being understood by their white colleagues. The other conversation that I had was with a white person. When I spoke to this person, this person expressed the fear of saying the wrong thing or messing up. This person asked how they could contribute to the solution, moving towards action to address racism and implicit bias, not only in the workplace, but also in the community. Intellectually, there is an understanding of the broad issue of systemic oppression and racism, but this person was not sure how to proceed from here. Based on these two conversations that I had, I'd like to offer the following steps to consider for our public workforce to consider. Number one, racial affinity group spaces. Oftentimes when we have tough conversations around race and we're trying to process and we're trying to reflect, it makes sense to seek out individuals that might have similar experiences um, that you may have. To that end, racial affinity group spaces are not a foreign idea. It allows members of the black community to come together to reflect, uh, to ask questions of each other, and just to be. It also allows members of the white community to come together to reflect, ask questions, and just to be. At my job at Health Leads, we have affinity group spaces for our African American team members, white team members, Latinx team members, and Asian Pacific Islander team members. And after we break off into our affinity groups, we often come back and we're able to be in dialogue with each other across affinity group space. Number two, in November, I had the opportunity to participate in the Racial Equity Institute Phase One training that was put on by uh, Deanna Allen Robb with the National Baby Strong Project at the Health Department. We had an opportunity to, for community individuals and health department team members to come together 
to have an, a, a, a deeper understanding about the historical analysis of race in this country. When I was in the room, I looked around and I reflected that there weren't that many individuals from our leadership team, executive leadership team, in the training. I think that was an opportunity for all of us to be in conversation together to better understand how racial equity plays a role in the work that we do in public health. To that end, my second suggestion is that we consider another racial equity institute training and we encourage and champion that our leadership at the health department, at the ELT level and above, be part of this training with community understanding historical analysis of race. The third solution or consideration that I'd like to offer is for our public health workforce to reflect back on the health equity resolution that we passed, I believe it was March 2019. For me, this is a litmus test that we can use to make sure that we're asking the right questions, we're executing the appropriate policies and, and work plans that are not system, that are not rooted in systemic racism or oppression, that help uplift our community and address health inequities by addressing racial equity. Through our conversations today in our meeting, I'm, I know what I'm going to do, what I always do, which is ask a lot of questions my questions are often rooted from that racial equity lens because I feel the passion about making sure that our black and brown communities, our vulnerable communities are not harmed in the work that we're doing in public health and population health. I'm encouraged by the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks with our team members because I know that they embody uh, what other people in the department are feeling and experiencing. I just want to say thank you to the Lent, uh, to the Metro Public Health Department team members and staff for doing what you do every day. We appreciate you and you make Nashville better for it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Franklin. Um, we have several meetings to minutes to approve, and um, I'm going to I'm going to um, let me go through each of them just. Um, Actually, you know, I'm going to go through one, two, three, four, five. I'd like to, if, if unless there's an objection, um, maybe have a motion for approval of all five at, at once. Um, if there's any discussion, I'd like to open that first, and then and then I would entertain a motion to approve all five, um, or or we can sequentially. So, is there any discussion on any of the minutes from anyone? All right. There will be a motion to approve all five of our of our minutes from March 12th, March 15th, April 9th, May 14th, and May 28th. I make approval. All right, Mr. Frederick, is there a second? Second. Okay. And and with Dr. Johnson and Campbell, if you have a thumbs up or down, we'll do it that way. So all in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Thumbs down. Thanks. Just for those watching elsewhere, there's four of us in, in the conference room. So that's how I feel. All right. Those carried. So thank you. Now, um, we have a deliberation of the end date for declaration of public health emergency. If you all remember from the um, when we established our public health emergency in March, um, and then I believe the subsequent meeting, we um, set a sunset at each month. So that each month, we can evaluate um, value the public health emergency. Just as a reminder, the public health emergency is what gives um, Dr. Caldwell the authority to essentially have done everything we've done to this point from, um, from uh, the phasing, the closure of certain places, uh, and, and much more done to this point. So um, as we've committed, we, once a month we would just evaluate, discuss, and um, I would entertain a motion, if, if so warranted, to continue for another month till the end of um, July. This is currently set to expire at the end of June, um, but I'd, I'd welcome any discussion or motion or, or a motion to approve. Motion to approve. All right, Ms. Franklin, a motion to extend. To, so may I just clarify your motion? The clarification of extension of this public health emergency until July 31st. Is, is, that, is that what you're? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
So there's a motion to extend the public health emergency until July 31st. Is there a second? Second. I second. Okay. second. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? All right. Thank you all. Okay. Um, why don't we do go through grants, uh, Mr. Diamond? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do not have any applications this time, so I'll move to the grants and contracts for approval. We have two that were included in the advance packet. Uh, the first one is uh, a, another year contract with Neighborhood Health. Uh, they provide medical dental services to uh, persons experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's three hundred fifty-five thousand two hundred dollars. And the second one is a uh, another a renewal of a, a grant with the state for the uh, HIV for medical services and linkage to care. Uh, that's fifty-four thousand seven hundred. So, happy to entertain any questions. Sir, or are there any questions on either of these grants or contracts? Uh, I have. Yes. Is um is this? Is this the grant that was held up, the HIV grant, or is there yet another one? No, this this just provides uh, a linkage to care, some some case management. The uh, the linkage to care was through the the Ryan White program, and um, I, I know you brought it up at the last meeting, and I emailed you separately. But uh, shortly after the last board meeting, all of those contracts were were through purchasing and in uh, in place. So. Uh, there are, are no more hang-ups as far as, as those were concerned. And thank you. Yes, you did. Okay. Any other discussion around either of these grants or contracts? If not, I would entertain a motion for approval of these grants or contracts. And contracts. So Ms. Etherington, his motion for approval. Is there a second? Second. Second, second. Mr. Frederick. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Uh, raise your hand. All right. All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, those carry. Thank you. Um, perfect. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I actually want to talk, give my direct, to my chair report real quick because there's a chance if the meeting goes till six, I have to step out. But so one message I'd like to deliver, um, two messages, is first of all, Dr. Johnson, this is her last meeting, and I'm grateful for your service. Um, her five year term has been full of lots of, Lots of um, amazingly important things, and I'm personally grateful for your um, mentorship, friendship, and leadership on, on a lot of issues in public health. Um, so thank you. That, that, so I want to make people know we'll we'll do a, some more formal stuff once, once we get a little further. But thank you. Yeah, we can all clap. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. We're very grateful. The mayor's office has... Um, I think is working on, on nominating someone. Um, I don't believe that, that has happened yet. Um, and when that person is nominated, whomever he or she may be, will be, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, additionally, just as, as you all have probably seen, I think Dr. Colin has filled us in in our report. Um, our case counts in, in Nashville, um, you know, we had 56 yesterday or this morning, I believe, number, um, our hospitalizations have stayed stable. So the state of COVID in our community is, is, is relatively stable, but we have had an upward trend in, in the past 14 days. And so we're still just pumping the brakes just a little before we were all into phase three. I was announced that earlier today. And anyway, that's it. And Dr. Campbell, are you raising your hand for something or no? Okay. Um, and if there's more time at the end of this, I will, I'll be glad to chat more, but Mr. Just a, just a quick question. In the, what I'm getting in the data reports, I don't, unless I'm not looking carefully, I don't see hospitalization. That's true. So are you saying hospitalizations are also up just a little bit, or are they? No, hospitalizations have been, the number of people hospitalized in Nashville proper yesterday, I checked the last year, it was 98, and that's across in, in Davidson County, not Davidson County residents. No, every, every, on our website every day, um, it's COVID-19 on National Cup, in the percentage of available beds, regular beds and ICU beds in all hospitals in Middle Tennessee is still around 20 something percent. So those have been pretty stable. But that around 100 a day hospitalized. That's been that way in, in, April, in April. Okay. So just so, just so you, you know, and that is something we're watching. But I, again, I will fill in more if, if time permits, um, but I did want to, 
give my greatest sincere gratitude to Dr. Johnson, so thank you. All right, now, um, discussion related to the May 20th special call meeting. Um, there, last time I, and I followed up having, um, I just wanted to open up the floor. I had last time um, had some discussions that we had, these are what we had agreed to, I, I, I thought last time was a weekly email from Dr. Caldwell um, with certain topics highlighted below. And then I, in my email talked about zero programs, um, accreditation, racial and health equity, um, status of outreach to partners, update on internal departments, electronic health records, wood buying, update on onboarding and COVID response. Um, I wanted to see what more, because we couldn't have talked about this after that meeting, um, what more things should be added to this list, number one. And second of all, just to remind everyone and Dr. Caldwell that an expectation is that between now and the next meeting and every subsequent meeting, there will be a point of contact with every board member and Dr. Caldwell, uh, whether it's a meeting, um, a sit-down meeting, a Zoom meeting, phone call, whatever, it fits both parties, um, but mainly driven by the board uh, member. And so I wanted to, I want to open the floor for further discussion. I just kind of want to circle back around that conversation. I, I think for me, what's missing, well, first of all, I don't, I don't think that we can, that we can fit everything into one list of what we should expect. Um, for me, I think this is a continuous conversation. I know at one point we had available to us the, um, as part of the SAB accreditation feedback for us to make sure that there is a, a, an opportunity for the board to submit questions of the director. And I would encourage us to re-institute that again and, so and it can be we'll, an ongoing dialogue. So for instance, um, if we, any outcomes for this meeting, we can, any questions that we have, we can write right. it down and get it to the director. And then of course, in a timely fashion, there's a response that comes back. But it, it, it creates an opportunity for ongoing communication. And if I remember right, that actually was an obligation of accreditation. Yes. Remember, it was we would say these are, and Martha or whomever was um, was helping us staffing the meeting would write that list down, and then the information would be delivered, and then there would be a circle back loop at the next meeting saying these items were delivered on these dates. Is that is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's yeah. it. So, Dr. Caldwell, I'm glad to follow up with you. Or Martha, I know knows exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So this list that, that you're talking about is a is a good start, but it is it is a it, eventually it'll get us to that ongoing. And, and I think it's a living, breathing document. So I think your what you mentioned is really really good is that that follow that that loop that that is required by FAB um, is a good way to. Think. Any other thoughts or discussions around this? This isn't really anything to vote on per se, unless we vote to, unless we want to. This is how we're proceeding, but I just wanted to give some time to discuss anything further on this matter. Okay. Well, Dr. Caldwell, we'll keep keep up with the updates as you've been doing, and and please make sure these meetings are scheduled. And and uh, and Martha, like I said, I think that forum was required. Dr. Ariola felt that, that was a really good way to confirm that we're doing the feed the loop feedback. So we can talk more about that. But. Sounds very reasonable. Thank you, man. Okay. Um, great. Now, data sharing discussion. Now, this is this is a good discussion to have. Um, I will say, um, we had put out a request of individuals to submit any any comments um, to us by writing, and I want to say, I'm so grateful to our community um, of, of Nashville. There's over 30 plus comments um, submitted. Um, I do want to especially highlight the um, letter that we received from members of the Health, Hospital, and Social Services Committee of the Council. And that letter, um, I, I defer everyone to if you want to read it, 98, page 98 of 127 in our packet. Um, and, and some great points were brought up that I think um, would be great to discuss. So. Before we get into the discussion, I would like Dr. Caldwell, the last time we talked about talking about, all right, what are we doing currently? 
I, I, like the, the nitty gritty of it. And I know that, that with um, the mayor's office, you and uh, others have been developing a, a new plan. And what's the details of that? And then open up for dialogue. Is that fair? We'll, we'll proceed like that. Sure. Uh, uh, just doing a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, sure. I'll be happy to go through that. Um, I just also like to take a moment to, to correct a, a previous. Um, I guess misunderstanding about when the board first became aware of uh, the department sharing data. Uh, and it, the minutes of April 9th that, that you just approved, uh, there was a report uh, from me and, and Dr. Bailey where we specifically discussed that we were on, on April 9th within a week of us starting the data sharing that the board uh, was informed of this. So that's uh, for your reference on page uh, 10 of 127 of the April 9th minutes. Just to refresh your memory, I, I think uh, there may have been some uh, for, uh, not, not remembering that that, that was shared uh, with you about this process on, on April 9th. Uh, but let me go right to what we're doing now and I'm, I'm going to read uh, from Mayor Cooper's uh, recent press release on this, which I think outlines it pretty clearly. Uh, I'd also like to recognize that we have Derek Smith from Legal here, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Keith Durbin from IT, who, who's helping us uh, as we evolve the system. So currently, the Metro Public Health Department shares names, addresses, and quarantine or isolation period, uh, whatever that may be, seven or 14 days for COVID positive individuals with the Metro Nashville Police Department. The Metro Nashville Police Department removes names, verifies addresses, and then provides addresses only to the Department of Emergency Communication. The Department of Emergency Communication's data retention policy uh, was modified recently to require purging of that data after 30 days. Uh, when it had initially been set up, it had been set up for longer than that. Uh, the municipal uh, police department uploads the names of the COVID positive residents into its record management system. Those names are checked daily against public health department records and removed from that system when quarantine orders expire usually within that seven to 14 day period. In addition, they review the names once a week to ensure that only active COVID positive residence data remains in the system. I do know that this information is used and it has helped reduce the spread of COVID uh, in our community and specifically in our institutions, in the hospitals and in the jails. Metro uh, first responders had uh, access this data uh, over 268 times when it resulted in a positive search. I've spoken to Sheriff Hall and uh, those uh, in the medical community in the emergency room and they say without a doubt knowing this information when uh, a patient or individual crosses the threshold into their building makes a, com uh, a big difference. They do react differently. As much as they'd like to treat everyone as if they have COVID, they, they don't have the capacity to be able to do it. So since we have the information and we know someone has COVID, it's urgent and critical during this public health emergency to share it with them. Uh, I can tell you that because of the feedback and concern about sharing this information the way we do now, that the mayor has directed a new uh, process. And that is to focus on safety, safety of privacy and data security concerns, as well as safety of, of our community and our first responders, fire, police, and EMS. So what we're going to do is change the system 
so that the data will reside only at the Department of Health and that uh, the Department of Health will have its own server. So this sharing of data uh, with the police uh, will stop. Uh, at this time, there is a technical working group which consists of members of our Department of Public Health, the uh, police department, the fire department, and our uh, IT department, as well as our Department of Emergency Communications. And we're working with Metro's emergency dispatch vendor, which is Motorola. Uh, and this will allow first responders to 911 calls to submit single queries to our new public health database. These individual reviews of an address will generate a simple yes, no answer to the question of whether a COVID positive person lists that address as their residence if they're an active case. Names will only be subject to review in the event the individual is being transferred either to a hospital or booking. Now, this is a new change and it further restricts access to this information. Uh, up until this time, when this change will be, uh, a, a first responder uh, or police officer might run a person's name if they might have had a traffic stop, for example. This will no longer happen. It will only be if the person is being physically transported to one of our institutions. And this is so critical because we know that that information is vital to those institutions, such as our hospitals and the jail, to know immediately if somebody is COVID, actively COVID positive or not. So this um, technical working group team has met uh, and uh, they are going to develop uh, a, a new workflow and timeline with the vendor, uh, Motorola. And I've asked uh, Mr. Keith Durbin to be here because uh, he was uh, involved with overseeing this technical work group. Uh, to really help us get the technology set up so that we can uh, move forward on this as soon as possible. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, uh, take, you can uh, take the, the floor back, Dr. Jahanger. Yeah, thanks. Listen, um, I, I did, I, I realized I didn't necessarily say that, that over 30 um, really great messages from, from our community. All of, I don't think I read one that was supportive of, of sharing with the police. I, I think for the sake of the public record, I need to make sure I, I say that. Um, I, I, so just FYI. All right, thank you for that update. I, I wanna open the floor up for questions and, and, um, and thank you for Mr. Durbin for being on if there are any questions around that. But I just want our, my colleagues to have the floor for any questions. If, if, and if you, Dr. Johnson or Campbell, if you have a question, either raise your hand physically or hit the, so Dr. Campbell, I see his hand is up. So Dr. Campbell, please. Well, um, there's so much uh, uh, impetus about uh, anxiety about um, the sharing of uh, data with the police. I just want to wonder about the other side. Uh, I remember, what was it, two, three years ago, there was a great deal of anxiety about uh, um, uh, in, uh, an enlarged gas transmission facility up in uh, uh, Pennington Bend, and we had to vote on it. And m much of the board was concerned about what was our liability if there was some sort of environmental uh, catastrophe up there. And I had some sense of uh, we as a board are kind of protected by the kind of uh, limited liability as public officials. Uh, when it comes to uh, the data sharing issue, if uh, some uh, first responder were to catch COVID and die when there was access of uh, where data about uh, who was positive could have made a difference in where this person was affected or not. What is our liability as a board for uh, potentially withholding information that would lead to someone's death? And are we protected legally by 
limited liability of a public employee? That was my question. I think that would be maybe to Mr. Smith. Can I ask for that, though? Yeah, hold on, please. Um, I yeah, think that's an excellent question. And to that end, I would ask, if a first responder, i.e. Um, an officer, a police officer, um, were not wearing a mask and they were coming in contact with routine contact with people that could be pre-symptomatic and still transmit the virus, that's the other piece that I, I want to make sure that we take into account in the full conversation around transmission. So not only those that we know have households are in households that are COVID positive, but also the officers, first responders, not wearing their face coverings like they should be doing, and they're coming in contact um, with individuals who could be pre-symptomatic. Mr. Smith, do you have any, uh, from a legal standpoint, um, response to either of those statements slash comments or? Well, let, let me unwind those a little bit. Uh, there's obviously a lot of tangential issues raised, but getting to Dr. Campbell's issues first, um, it is the fact that the board itself and the board members um, generally likely have a claim of immunity, discretionary function immunity, uh, or that uh, the claims are barred because you're acting in your in your normal role and duties as the board. Um, however, uh, that doesn't completely answer the question because even though uh, the board itself may be immune, Metro may have some liability. Metro is typically the named party in litigation. And again, your decision itself may be subject to a defense of exercising discretionary function immunity. You're developing sort of a, a policy. However, um, if, if information that could have potentially uh, not resulted in a harmful injury to an employee, Metro is in an unusual position in that it uses what's called an injured on duty system. Not a, it's not part of Tennessee's workers' compensation system. Some of you may be familiar that under workers' comp law, an employee that's injured in the line of duty may make a workers' comp claim, but their claim has caps under workers' comp law. Um, Metro's employees are able to sue Metro for negligent claim. And Metro's immunity is removed for negligent kind. And so under that, however, the good thing under the Tort Liability Act is uh, typically those claims are capped at $300,000. So Metro could potentially have a lawsuit to defend. Uh, you all might be named and the board might be named and we would present defenses. Um, and so, uh, those may be defensible claims as to the board and as to even Metro, but uh, uh, that's just a general thumbnail sketch of, uh, of governmental tort liability and then uh, where you all would be not really, you're probably exercising discretionary function that gives you each individually perhaps some protections. Uh, I wanna get, I want to get to a meat of something here. I just want to reiterate what I heard Dr. Caldwell says and my, well, my understanding is of, of what this new policy is, because I want to make sure that I'm saying it in, in the right way and, and that, and I also want to know when this will go in effect. So what I hear, what I've heard you say and what I've, I've, I've heard said also um, through external conversations is this. The database that now holds um, that will now hold information of who is COVID positive in our city will be housed in the Department of Health database. Is that, a, is that, is that true, Dr. Caldwell? Just yes or no? Yes. yes. You will, uh, key, yeah, I mean, that, that okay. is the intent, yes. Okay, yes. so, so, yes. so yes. I don't want intent. It's, there's a database that's housed in the Department of Health that's managed by Department of Health, period. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Now that database, through this IT solution, a person at the emergency dispatch 
can query that database on a case-by-case -case basis. So if somebody, if there's a 911 call about a fire uh, emergency or something to that effect, the first responders um, can ask this fact that there's someone who's living with COVID now. It's how I understand it happened. So it has to be an ask by the first responder, is the address I'm responding to a COVID positive patient or not living there? And it's a yes or no answer is what I understand it to be. Current status is any dispatch, it's, it's, it's automatically queried from the police um, database. So that's the difference I, from my understanding. Is that, is that accurate? You're right. The the information will not be embedded in the system now. They'll have to be. And I, I would ask Mr. Durbin to, for the technical piece of it. All right. I, I, All right. I, I, that's fine. Okay. I just want to I just want to lay the facts out and make sure everyone's on the same page here. Right. So, database from health, emergency dispatch can query if asked, and and it, and the question is: Is somebody living at this address? Yes or no? Okay. The second yeah. way a quarry can happen is if an EMT or a police officer is taking someone to the hospital or the booking, they can also reach out to emergency dispatch who then can reach out to health to see if someone who is COVID positive is being transported and they get a yes or no answer. Um, then my understanding is, um, is, or maybe you can clarify, my understanding is when somebody has been cleared from the Department of Health as cleared, so when I report every morning or so many thousands of people have been cleared. The moment they're cleared, they now no longer will be in that system that, that dispatch can access, right? That, that's correct. The answer will come back no. And it will be a day-to-day -day update? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, and then um, is there a way for anyone outside of health to query, query who has had COVID in our city? No. There's no other way you can do that. So any databases are all stored in health. health. I know the this state has one special, too. This, this will be a special public health server. Okay. All right. Well, okay. okay, so knowing that, when when would this go into effect if it goes into effect? I'm just curious, when would it go into effect from what, what we're doing now? Uh, as soon as, Durbin, as soon as possible. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mr. Durbin. Hey, uh, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Jangier. The We are working with the vendor and we are dependent upon the vendor to implement a solution. So the, the, the technical working group, which is, you know, the purpose of is implementing policy made in the health department or board of health, um, anticipates having a statement of work for the vendor Motorola at the, by the end of next week. That then goes to Motorola, they analyze it, and based on prior experience of, of our Department of Emergency Communications, who's used this system for years, we're talking in terms of delivery within months, not weeks, months. Um, but it will be several weeks, uh, probably, after we deliver this statement of work to them before we'll, we'll have an estimate of what we can bring back to you. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I, 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 read, I give up my time. Anyone else want to speak or ask questions? I, I, I believe that where we're headed is better than where we are. I still have concerns. Uh, the first concern being that I don't really understand why a first responder would need to know if there were a COVID positive person there or not. Because if you're going to respond to a location, you should be treating everyone exactly the same, whether it's a police officer or a paramedic. You, you know, you should be doing that. You shouldn't, you should be wearing your mask. You are not going to confront someone unless you have to. You're not going to be that close and intimate with someone unless you have to. So it seems to me that that, that portion of it doesn't seem like a real need. Now, if you're taking someone to a hospital or to a station to be booked, I can understand that because you don't want to take them and put them in a room with a bunch of other people and potentially have that spread. So I think that I agree with the second half, but not the first half. And my biggest question is, it's going to take months. What do we do between now and then? I mean, we've got a situation now where we are very out of sync with what our community wants to have done. I understand the public health concern, but I also understand the personal responsibility that each of these individuals who's interfacing with the public as a Metro employee has to protect themselves as well as protect the person that they're interacting with. So, okay, so. thank you, Shrek. Ask a question, or not even ask a question, but I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on the liability concern, and I think that's a valid concern. And if 
we should also be thinking about that question, not only in terms of first responders, but other Metro employees, particularly those that are working in MDHA housing and also teachers as they start school. Um, because they're gonna come in contact more than likely with pre-symptomatic individuals or individuals that just haven't shown symptoms or haven't been tested and they have COVID. So, I mean, I think it's a slippery slope, but it's not black or white, no pun intended. I uh, appreciate that. I, I would ask uh, Mr. Smith that I know HIPAA provides specific uh, protection. So I, I don't believe it is a slippery slope from a legal standpoint. We can only share this data uh, with certain people. So Mr. Smith, can you provide further context for that? Uh, I believe what you're referring to, the, uh, the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued a bulletin in February of this year uh, dealing specific, specifically with the uh, COVID-19 outbreak disease outbreak, and it, it authorizes the sharing of the information with, it uses even the term law enforcement. Um, there are also OSHA guidelines that have been issued going to Ms. Franklin's uh, liability concerns that deal with employers having a duty to provide its employees with, uh, you know, a low risk of being harmed at work or, or a, an environment where there's a lower risk. Uh, that guidance also though, specifically in reference to emergency response workers, uh, identifies at, at the very highest risk level, first responders, particularly when they are performing aerosol generating procedures, such as cardiopulmonary resuscitation uh, and both police and fire and EMS workers, if they're the first at the scene, they begin to employ those life-saving measures. And I don't know if there has been information provided as to what level of exposure is faced if all the person has is a mask and what type of mask they have. Uh, there may be situations where they can obtain additional protective measures with the information as to what conditions the person that they're trying to treat is experiencing. So it's all what you all need to, you know, or what you are doing, weighing in the balance your considerations here uh, of what's going on. But specifically, yes, there's a recognized exception in the guidance from the uh, Civil Rights Division that uh, the sharing of uh, a simple, uh, identity of uh, whether or not there's someone with that condition is something that is permitted. I should also mention though, I, I think there's something else in the current system as I understand it. Um, in the current system, the address is what's given initially. It's only once actual um, first response measures are being taken that the name is queried. In other words, upon approach, the first responders know there's someone at the address so that they can start taking appropriate precautions. And if nothing develops, they don't go to the next step of determining the actual personal identity of anyone. So there is that layer of protection in the current system as well, as I understand. Uh, Ms. Franklin, you also though, I think you were asking about uh, where an employee declines to wear their protective mask. Um, and I would just simply say, that gets into the um, defensive claims type of measures. You know that if 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 the proper protective gear is available and it's not utilized, then uh, arguments would be made that that person isn't exercising due care for their own health and safety, despite being provided the resources. Whether or not all the resources are available could be a counter argument that could hurt Metro's defense of such claims. Does that Dr. Jahan, yeah, yes, and I'm wondering about the risk of the individual that the officer or first responder comes in contact with. So is, is that person, um, the resident, if they're coming in contact with an officer, 
this is theoretically, that possibly could be pre-symptomatic and virus is spread and, and the officer's not wearing the mask, that's a consideration that's concerning as well. Yeah, I mean, as Chair, I want to be very clear. I, 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 and, I, and I hope that the police is now formally, I know that's passed and, there's, or, and are doing the policy, uh, but I mean, I think that's a very, 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 very important concern that I'm glad is being brought up is, is wearing the mask, and I just took my off for a minute to, to get me off from the side to drink, is, is, uh, is critical for protection of our safety. So public safety, wearing a mask is an important public safety thing. So I just want to also echo that, that this, is, this is an important thing. Um, sure. and, and, and to both of your points, is, as you know, the, the current requirements in the orders and so forth is that employees, when they are interacting with the public, are, re are at that point required to wear masks. Such that you see right now, while I'm speaking and I'm sitting in my lone office, uh, you know, sectioned off from everyone else, that's where it's not essential. But as soon as I interact with public or any other person that's an employee in Davidson County, they are required and should be wearing their mask. So that, and, uh, I think that goes to what Dr. Uh, Jahangir and, and uh, Ms. Franklin were just now alluding to. And, uh, I'd like to mention, oh, so, so, may, may I? Yeah, oh, sorry, please. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Paul. Oh, okay. No, two, two items. Is, uh, one, uh, Dr. Jahangir, we, we have uh, talked uh, about this with uh, our first responders that oftentimes they wear that blue surgical mask. But if they know that somebody's uh, COVID positive, they'll then proceed to put on additional PPE, the N95 mask and other protection. And also, um, it's important to note that it, it allows the, the person interacting, uh, our first responder interacting with somebody, if, if they're able to, put the mask on this individual also, because that will help protect them uh, as well, protect the first responder. So that's something that, um, that the more information that we can give our, our first responders to, to help you know, do their job to protect the community and to protect them, I, I think this is really shown to be a successful policy and has, I think, directly uh, been uh, connected to having no uh, outbreak in our uh, institutions like the hospitals uh, or, or the jail. Thank you. So I would like to know who was responsible for training police, fire, park police, um, the EMT, uh, who, who has done this training with them about the significance of mask wearing and just the general protocol? Carol? This is Dr. Yeah. Wright. Um, I was hoping you might be there. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Um, most of the department, I mean, obviously, uh, EMS and fire are used to wearing masks, and, and so that's not uh, a big deal. I don't know who within um, police has, has necessarily done that. I know that um, they're usually pretty good to reach out to me if they have any questions. And I haven't had any significant questions, so, um, but I don't know specifically who would have done that training. Well, it kind of would be nice to find out, you know, just to ask, um, so, to ask how and what did they do to ensure that uh, police officers have and do continue to, um, to, to follow the, the so Martha, if you're listening, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier, things to follow up on. We need an explanation of the police training, how they're doing it, and, and what the policies are. So ideally, before met, before our next meeting, get it via email, but then follow up. I'd like to probably an answer in the next day or so, right? It shouldn't be a hard question to get an answer to, but via email, and then follow up via, via follow up subsequently um, in our next board meeting, say these are their requests from last meeting, and this is when they were delivered. That's 
And then on our, this just follows up on our conversation earlier, which we need for, um, anyway, sorry. Well, sorry. And I guess that the other reason I'm asking is not just hindsight, but going forward, you know, we're going to have school enforcement officers. We're going to have um, uh, various and sundry people. I mentioned park police, but it's the, the um, parks open. I, I just think it'd be nice. Yeah, it would just be nice if we knew uh, that there was a basic protocol for, and as different as the jobs are, um, who's doing what in terms of ensuring that these folks aren't just being left to figure it out by virtue of what they're hearing on TV or whatever. Yeah, it would be good to see documentation of the process itself and then what's actually occurring, documentation that is actually occurring. I mean, I don't know if that's micromanaging, but if we are responsible for oversight of this, it seems that seeing that policy that is in place would be helpful, if there is one. And, and I, I'm not suggesting, let me say, I know, at least I think I have a, some degree of appreciation for how much work this workforce is doing. So I'm not suggesting that I think MPHD needs to, to take that on uh, as yet another massive uh, task. I just think we need to know who, what, and how people are being trained so we can respond to questions about it. Any other questions or discussions? Yeah, I, I do. I'm yes, Ms. Frank. I'm going to take off my mask so I can. And so I'm going to, I have, I have a few comments, and I'm going to be succinct because I don't want to belabor points. Um, bottom line, I'm not in support. I'm not comfortable with continuing data sharing. And i just like to cite, we have the feedback from the public, from the written public comments. I know some individuals I've heard um, were under the impression that they have an opportunity to speak. And I just like to acknowledge that and apologize. Um, but we, uh, we hear you and see you. Um, so just real quickly, one, Cook County, uh, Chicago, their, their, their commissioner of health said, as much as we recognize that our first responders need all of the support that is required during the pandemic, it can't be at the expense of families and communities that have been marginalized by racism for far too long in this country. And what's underlying our conversations around COVID, particularly in Southeast Nashville, um, is race. We also have, uh, uh, concerns that were expressed by our um, Vanderbilt colleagues, Dr. Ellen Wright Clayton, um, Dr. Bradley Mullen, and Dr. Consuelo Wilkins outlined in a Tennessean op-ed um, on March, May 14th, I believe, um, expressing concerns and advocating that we not move forward with how we're disclosing data. And then lastly, my several comments. So I've spoken with a lot of advocates in the, involved in police community relations. Some have, have stopped encouraging people to get tested, although they're not actively um, discouraging. So they just stopped saying, yes, you should go get tested. And as opposed, instead, they're just remaining silent. If we allow this policy to continue in light of the current dynamics and conversations around race in our community and across the nation, in light of what happened to Mr. Floyd, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Clemens, Mr. Hambrick, more recently, Mr. Johnson and others, it sends a bad message that we're just not in step with the direction of this country and, and, and our own health equity resolution that we just passed last year. Um, we also have concerns regarding our undocumented communities and our homeless communities, our individuals living with, with homelessness. Unless we have been involved in policing, I don't think any of us around the board table understand the deep layers of policing policy that may include different types of data collection that are not at the forefront of what we're talking about today. And there are legal loopholes. I don't know all those details, but that's when I would turn to the Community Oversight Board for their expertise, and I wonder why haven't they been engaged in terms of vetting the policy um, regarding sharing data with first responders. 
Um, I'm wondering if Nashville received a legal opinion before we started doing this. I'm wondering why the state, while Governor Lee changed the policy, if our, is the state concerned about liability? Why or why not? Um, I talked about before that we have a COB community oversight board expertise, and they should be at the table considering this, just like we should have been at the table considering this early on. Um, what about Metro Human Relations Commission and issues around equal protection of COVID-19 persons and protections? Um, and what about the civil liberties uh -huh. protections and privacy issues for other people in the household, other family members or other neighbors um, in terms of what this has, what this means to them? All around, I'm concerned this was not done with public input. Even the new plan that's being considered, that has not been done with public input. And I would like to advocate that we, as a Board of Health, the Community Oversight Board, Metro Human Relations Commission, at, at the very least, have an opportunity to vet what comes out of the technical team if it gets to that point. But I do have a, a couple, um, a sweet, I do have a motion I'd like to make at the appropriate time. Your floor for this is the topic we're discussing. I move that we cease data sharing with first responders immediately and we confirm that with an official communication and that it is formalized with, a, with an official order. I second. All right, um, so let me just understand. To move to cease data sharing and re to confirm with an official. And confirm the, 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 confirm the cease and desist order with an official communication. So it's not just verbal, um, it's the official communication and it, also, and it is also formalized in an official order. Can I, can we, uh, is this so, discussion on, closed? Yeah, yeah, just, just let me, I'm just trying to go through my progress. So there is a motion, uh, move to DC sharing, reconfirm with official communication formalized in order. There's a second by Mr. Frederick and open for discussion and I believe, um, who who is uh, i want to say dr johnson has been waiting to speak um so we'll discuss further so the motions on the table and second is now i'm going to open up more discussion dr johnson and dr campbell and we'll go in that order dr johnson you're muted can you hear me now yes okay hi so wow so this is a powerful discussion and um i really I'm thankful for the hard work Ms. Franklin has done bringing the bigger picture to us today. I have to recuse myself from this uh, vote because I have a nephew who is in the police force. He's a lieutenant and I have several, several dear friends who are EMS. So I feel like that uh, I have some bias, the catch word of the, this decade is bias. But uh, I also am a little startled by um, us assuming that all of Nashville is up in arms. I know that many of the council members are up in arms, much of the minority community is up in arms, but we have not asked the rest of the community how they feel about this. So before we just lay down the gauntlet, I, I think there should be a public forum, you know, what does the community really want? And um, I bet Ms. Franklin's position will prove to be the one what the community wants, but I would like for everybody to have a voice, even people that look like me. Thank you. I, I would say we did open up for um, comments and received 30 plus comments um, in 24 plus hours and all were strongly opposed. So I, I will say that we have had within the bounds of our charter have been able, we did do an open, um, Call for so I, I, I would just throw it out there. Um, and, and I wasn't aware of the open call. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Johnson. How did you do the open call? I wasn't aware of it. How did, was it an email or was it uh, it was in a formal request call. that Martha sent? Um, public at large, it was posted. It's just the way they normally do requests. Yeah, and so when the meeting notice was posted, I mean, I couldn't communicate with you to tell you that we did that, but I was a, we, we did that. That's what those, it's in your packet. 
It's 30 pages of. Yeah, well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Campbell, do you have a statement to make? Yes, I'm, I am uh, very sympathetic to the feelings that are involved in the concern about data sharing. Um, and the history of where it comes from. My concern is this is gonna last six months or a year and then we'll pass. I can't ethically support something that puts uh, um, something that has to do with concerns about privacy and intensive motion above a risk to human life. I can't support that. They, they seem uh, conflicting to me and I can't take a value that's in opposition to human life. So I can't support it. But that's just my opinion. Well, I think that seeing a lot of information light and um, to know that out of, I think it was 450 queries that were run, 268 had a positive. That kind of information uh, was new to me because I, I have asked several times in several meetings for what what's the, what are the stats, what are the metrics, what has caused this to happen? So it, it, it's really difficult, I think, to, to, to go there because I have been opposed to this from the beginning in that it, it, we couldn't get any science or data to, to say why it's important. Well, if these stats are correct, that's somewhat um, compelling. But also, what for me is realizing that there are people who likely are not being tested out of the fear that we spoke about. And that's speculation, but I think it's based on familiarity with different populations and with talking with people who work directly with them. So um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. John, where you sit on this, if you have more inside information about the security of this new system. Because the new system, is, in terms of what I was hearing, not just from Dr. Caldwell, but otherwise, is a much more safeguarded kind of system, but still probably has real flaws. And one of the biggest ones is the amount of time it's gonna put it in place. That, I think, is the biggest concern. So your, your thoughts on this are really significant. Yeah, so, so I want a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, as, as chair of this meeting, I don't think Dr. Johnson Having a family member per se, an EMS or or, um, or police is, is should necessarily exclude you. I was an EMT myself. Um, I'm obviously a practicing physician, so I, I just I'm just throwing it out there. Now, to your point, um, Ms. Hetherington, is I like this new policy. Uh, uh, um, I think this new policy is a good. Um, Good potential solution between the, the different um, really important points on this matter. And, and the reason is that the Department of Health holds the data. I think you, it can only be queried under very, I'm making these assumptions, right? I'd like to see it written out. I, I, I wanna highlight that. Being very, these queries are being made under very specific um, things, um, rules. The, you can, one can, track who queried them. Um, but, you know, uh, so I, 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 hearing that the timeline today, I, that was the first time I've heard that as well. Um, That's disturbing. Yeah, and, and so I, that gives me a lot of pause. I, I also think having, you know, input of, of, of 
stakeholders and people impacted is, is really important, right? So I think this this policy, this process should be open to input, open to, input, open to, to some feedback. However, I do also think that we are in a moment uh, in which more fast deliberative action is needed, and I appreciate appreciate that that happening. I just um, so when it comes to the new thing, I, I really know the thought. I, I do know the thought that's been put into the new policy um, from from really good people who think through this. I like the new policy um, a lot more than where we're at now, uh, and so just the time to get there is has, is, has surprised me. So that's where I that's where I stand at that. Is that? Uh, I'm sorry. Is Chief still on? Chief, uh, could you state again? You, you believe that it would be weeks and to sort of process it and possibly months to Im implement? So uh, Keith, I'm here, um, and so thank you for the question. So the the, the basis of this um, solution is automation through the Department of Emergency Communications existing computer-aided dispatch system. And so automation is the key. Um, and so that system is developed and, uh, by Motorola. It is one of the big players in this game nationally. And based on the prior experience with the Department of, Communi of Emergency Communications, when you take something to that organization, obviously a, a big global company that has uh, 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 lots of demands on it, their past experience is that when they give them a statement of work to do something similar, the response they get back is typically in months, not weeks. And so that's the basis by which we are going on it could possibly be the situation that this technical working group that is that is working toward a documented solution, and thank you, Dr. DeHanger, all of those things are part of the written specification that we are going to work up, is a written technical specification that we will deliver to Motorola. Um, uh, Steve Martini, who is the director of DEC, has longstanding um, affiliation with Motorola and Motorola rep. So he's already talking to them, letting them know this is coming. Um, and it very well could be the case that they take a look at this specification, say, you know, that to doing this, it, it could take less than months. What we wanted to do um, after our first discussion is, is try to set the expectation in alignment with what our, our past experience has been. It could come back differently. They could say this is a priority for them. We just we just don't know. And so that's that's why um, the month's statement is is out there. Thank you. So, what happens between now and then? Do we keep sharing the data? And then I have questions. I always have questions, but about how do we verify that MNPD is purging? Um, how do we verify that they scrub the list early on? There are just lots of questions about data that are no, it's no longer in our hands. Um, and how do we vet the process? Um, one, one thing I want to bring up, you know, Chair Schrager, is the public comments around the current policy. There are only a public comments around the, the up, more updated policy as, as well um, at some point. Um, just throwing it out there. And it's a good thing to discuss as a group. Um, it does answer your question. I recognize these are two separate things. I just want to throw it out there as we start discussing because there are really two things. There's still in motion that's active to see um, data sharing and, and reconfirm an official yeah. communication formalized in order. That's still that's active. So, we're still in discussion around that, just for formal Robert theory. Right. I want to just sort of re reinforce the, a big part of the reason for my second of that motion is that we have a process in place that does not seem to be at all in fitting with what our community wants. We are weeks, if not months, away from having a solution that is better, and some of us might get on board with that solution. So I seconded the motion largely based on the fact that we have a situation now where information is much more freely available that I'm comfortable with and that I feel that we should stop it until we have a better solution and the technology to implement that solution at a minimum. And I think that we should, as a board, vote on 
implementing that when it comes around. That motion is still on the table. Any other discussion around this motion and this topic? Dr. Johnson and Campbell, I'm looking at you guys, make sure I'm not missing a hand raise or something. Well, yes, Dr. Campbell. I felt I was perhaps a little uh, uh, not as coherent as I could be. I, I see uh, the conflict as being between a concern about data being misused by law enforcement in some way that would violate privacy and be uh, harmful in the way it has been used uh, in the past, like HIV and things going back to Tuskegee experiments and so on. Um, that is in conflict with the risk to uh, human life that's involved with first responders having to deal with people who have the, have the, to, who are infectious and are known to be infectious. And in view of that conflict, I personally have to go on the side of I can't support something that would put people at risk without the data that is going to cause more harm to other people. That's just my perspective. I want to be clear about. It. Okay. All right, uh, Campbell, anything else, or, or do you have something, Dr. Uh, hi, and yeah, I, um, like I said, I have a card in this game, but I 100% uh, uh, agree with Dr. Campbell's uh, assessment. If I were to vote, I, I'm planning to abstain. If I were to vote, I would not at this point be able to um, to just cut it off entirely. Well, this is, a, this is an old question, but I realize the state came out with this, but within Davidson County, and perhaps Dr. Caldwell, you're the best one to respond, where did the impetus come from at the very beginning of this? Was it from us as a health department? Was it from uh, Metro PD or Metro Fire or somewhere else. If if you can share that, it would be sort of helpful. Yes. Uh, well, we uh, brought this to your attention on April 9th, right after we uh, started it, and uh, at that time, we specifically said we were seeing the great uh, um, real carnage uh, from uh, the, corona, the coronavirus in New York City, specifically with first responders, specifically with police. Not only were they uh, having about 30% of their workforce not able to work at any time, they were getting sick, they were dying. And yes, um, it was uh, uh, a specific incident or two where the police entered a home uh, that did have COVID and they had you know, not been aware and they had let us know that had they been aware, they uh, would have been able to you know, be, take more precautions. And earlier that time, they, they didn't have the kind of PPE they have now. They still don't have the adequate amount. And I think especially when it comes to uh, law enforcement, they, they don't kind of uh, gear up with PPE the way you might do it uh, in the um, you know, an EMS type of, of call. Uh, so, so once again, it was uh, uh, late March, early April. It began April 3rd and, and the board was informed right away on April 9th. And at the time, the conversation as reflected in the minutes, so that the board was very concerned about the safety of the, the uh, police uh, and the uh, masks uh, and, and, and what we were doing to try to protect them. And uh, there was no uh, question about what we did. It was an automatic, gut positive, you know, scientific. We're in a public health emergency. We're doing all we can to protect our first responders. And, and the board at that time didn't ask any questions. And, and so uh, it was only until um, the uh, media uh, attention uh, the following month in May that the board came back and, and started to question this. But you, you had known since April 9th. All right, and Dr. Caldwell, with due respect, I mean, that's not the matter at hand here. I hear, I hear what you're saying. 
I mean, but as a board chair, I, there's a, okay. I, I think the question, um, the question of Ms. Etherington was, how did it come about, period? And I, and I, I get, I, just so we're clear, I mean, I want to focus, there's still a motion. This is all part of a discussion of a motion that there will need to be a vote on. And I got to look back here because my computer, I can't see if anyone's raising their hand. Um, I've lost data in case anyone's right. Um, so, okay, did I answer your question, Ms. Etherington? No, I don't know. Um, okay, I don't awesome. Know. Uh, yes, ma'am, of course. Did the request, who who initiated the request to share data? Yeah. Who initiated the request to share data? Was it you, Dr. Caldwell? Was it Chief Anderson? Was it Mayor Cooper? Was it someone Chief off the street? Swan. Chief Swan. Who, who made the initial request to share data? It, it was the... Uh, the law enforcement community. So was it Chief Anderson specifically that reached out to you? Or was there someone else from the law enforcement community, at Metro Nashville Police Department that reached out to you? It, it was a collection of people when I've been in the emergency operations center every day. So this was a discussion that came up. Okay. I don't think he's gonna ask, answer my question. Any other discussion? I'm sorry, my internet on my thing is, is hurt, so I'm gonna look back here. Any other discussion? Um, okay, just, just okay. being really clear here about what we actually are voting on. Yes. We're voting on asking for a cessation of this. Period. And with, with, well, with, with the caveat of, um, uh, can, I, can you just read your, read your motion more directly? I move that we cease data sharing with the first responders and we confirm this uh, cease and desist with an official communication and a formalized official order. Mr. Smith, the formalized official order, I'm gonna just refer to you for a second for, um, is that, is this, can we have a formalized order? Or is it necessary? Or is it necessary? That's, yeah, I, I, that's the one part of the motion that I'm just not unclear on, because we can move to seats and, and confirm with an official written statement, uh, but is there an order that, I'm just, just help me understand if an order is necessary. If the, if the, if the intention, if I can in, get your intent, is to stop this data sharing and make it in a way that it, it, it's very officially stopped. Yeah. So do we need an order is the question I have for you, Mr. Smith. It, it would not be necessary if you adopt this motion, it would be pursuant to your powers under the public health emergency, because this is a motion in response to that, and your oversight is directing the cessation, or would be to cease sharing um, the COVID positive results with first responders. So no, it's not necessary to have an order. Are you willing to amend to not have the order? I amend my motion to read the following. I move that we cease data sharing with the first responders and we confirm that with an official communication. Okay. Could I, yes, but would you re, re, would you re second what she just said, yes. the amendment? Okay, so the motion is to cease data sharing. So the previous motion was pulled, motion is to cease data sharing and reconfirm with official um, statement and just stop data sharing. Okay, and Ms. Etherington, more discussion, yes. I think I would be more comfortable with it if we said cease until we have clarification of the kind of time it will be to implement this in the, in the system. I mean, if we had a couple of weeks that, that these people would do this, then if we are gonna trust our health department with this data, then I think that we can trust that it would only be released in a very appropriate manner. The concern I have is saying uh, across the board, cease and desist, or whatever the language is, that um, it's, it's like we're saying uh, permanently. And without these stats, and without knowing the amount of work that went into trying to figure out how to alter this system, 
I think I would be more inclined to just arbitrarily say absolutely. I, I agree, but I'm really, I'm really struggling here. I think that the opportunity would exist to, to reintroduce sharing of the information once we know that. Well, I guess that's, that's the way I'm doing it. I mean, yeah, I don't, I it's not part of the motion, but that's the way I see this. This is a motion for now. If the situation changes, then you motion can be put on the floor to then share it. But from my viewpoint, oh, we can, we can, we can do that. I mean, my my whole thing is transparency and making sure that we have the appropriate uh, vetting of the new policy, making sure that we have the appropriate individuals at the table. For and so I have another motion that could probably get to get to that. So, so I have to vote on one motion first. Um, if you want to just give a hint of what your new motion may be, so, so people know what you're well, thinking before so, you vote so, on the motion. So John do you have a we do have a motion on the floor with discussion on that motion, so. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, well, I, I think um, we're not, she's not, Ms. Okay. Franklin's not giving a motion. She's just gonna tell us what a future, okay. I mean, we can vote on this without knowing what she's gonna say. Why don't we just let her just tell her what she's gonna say. This is not a motion. So, so at the end of the day, I, I want transparency. I, I am not in, in agreement with data sharing, but I recognize that, um, that we need to move forward with a plan that all of us are comfortable with. To that end, I would be more amenable to considering a plan that has been vetted by, um, that's been presented and vetted by the Board of Health, the Community Oversight Board, Metro Human Relations Commission, and the Harry Medical College, because they're running the test assessment centers. With all of those entities around the table vetting a plan and coming together with a policy to move forward. Without the input of those particular stakeholders, I would feel uncomfortable moving forward with any type of data sharing plan, period. So let, let's do this. I, I'm gonna close discussion on the first motion. I think we've discussed it enough. So the motion, the first motion is, has been motioned and second is to move to cease data sharing and reconfirm with the official communication. That's the motion on the table. It's been seconded by Mr. Franklin, presented by Ms. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Frederick, presented by Ms. Franklin. So I'll just go and, and um, Mr. Frederick. Yes. Ms. Etherington. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Ms. Franklin. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Or, um, Dr. Johnson. Abstain. All right, Mr. Campbell, Dr. Campbell, excuse me. I oppose. Um, I, I, I'm not voting as chair. So two to one um, with two abstentions, this motion carries. So thank you. So we will we will move forward with that. So. Um, Second motion. Yep, second motion on the table. I move that we, I move uh, that we, okay, let me reword this. I move that any further plan that is considered for data sharing be vetted by the Board of Health, the Community Oversight Board, Metro Human Relations Commission, and the Harry Medical College representatives from those entities. And that we have the agreed upon protocol. That's it. So I move that we, um, that any plan that's presented um, be vetted by the Board of Health, COB, Metro Human Relations Commission, the Harry Medical College upon the uh, agreed upon protocol before it goes into policy. Okay. So essentially, everyone has to agree on the protocols before it, we move forward with the new data sharing policy. Okay, there's a motion as worded. There is a second for such a motion. Can we ask a question? Of course. Um, who who are we recommending convene this? I think the health department can convene. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I think, Do I we think. we need to put that in there? If the health department is, is Designated as convening this? Yes. Okay. I move that Metro Public Health Department can, uh, oh, 
Yeah. It's hard to remember. Yeah, being a group. <laughs> <laughs> I move that Metro Public Health Department um, present any data sharing protocol to an advisory committee for approval before it goes into policy. This committee should include the Board of Health, Community Oversight Board, Metro Human Relations Commission, and representatives from the Harry Medical College. Okay, that's the motion. Um, any more discussion before, or there hasn't been a second, but any discussion or a second? I would second. Okay, second by Mr. Frederick. Open for discussion. Dr. Campbell or Johnson, I'm watching you guys. Do you have any discussion you'd like to make? Well, I feel like I've gotten to take, uh, uh, gotten uh, polarized a bit. Uh, I just would uh, have concerns about whether you could ever realistically get consensus from so many people. I, think I would support it if it happened. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Johnson, any comments? You're muted, Dr. Johnson. I agree with Dr. Campbell. Um, you know, there's so many stakeholders uh, in this proposal that it would take weeks and months to get everyone together. And uh, what if we had a partial coalition rather than a full coalition? Would it be simple majority of people in the room? For instance, you know, I'm a, I'm a Meharian, but I count to be like a Meharian person. So um, there's too many loopholes in this for me to agree that part of the issue I agree with when it's better, let's try again. I agree with that part, but I think there's entirely too much red tape to be efficient in a pandemic. Okay. Any other discussion? Well, I just wonder if maybe we we want a first responder person. Well, we have the community oversight board and they have first responders on the board. Yeah. They do. Yes, they have. They have um, experienced law enforcement on on the board. Okay. So, or, or part of the community oversight board. So that's why I would defer to them on issues around policing that we may not understand, and we can have a better understanding around the health. It really is a. It really is making sure we have all the right expertise at the table. And we have Meharry Medical College too. But is it fair to ask somebody to represent two entities, the Community Oversight Board and their whatever they are, whether it's law enforcement, sheriff's department, whatever? You no, know, at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that this is transparent. And so we can ask questions, pressure tests, to make sure that there are no holes. This is not meant to deter anything from moving forward, just to make sure it has the appropriate eyes on it. Before it didn't have that. And now the community is up in arms and we don't know what's happening with that data, or at least I'm not comfortable. And so this is really is an attempt to make sure that we are transparent and the appropriate professionals around the table have a chance to input to make sure that this policy is a solid one that Nashvillians can trust and feel comfortable with. Okay, so my last question, and then I'll let it go, but I just think there's so many people who've been engaged in this. If that group is convened, is it not also um, fair to invite persons who are working with uh, foreign-born uh, you know, and others who've had such a concern about yeah, this? I, I, I thought about that. I, I do know that, um, I, I believe that there is a representative on the Metro Human Relations Commission that could speak to that particular community. Um, originally, I suggested maybe someone from Turk, but I limited it to the Metro agencies or the Metro entities and the Harry Medical College because they're running the assessment center. But I'm completely open to that um, because we don't want it to be so large. But, no, you're right, and I think yeah. you're only talking about one individual representing each of those places, right? Well, I, 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 I think we could do one or two, but I'm open to, to that. I don't know if we have to determine that right now, or unless we want to make sure we include okay. that. Okay, I just, I just want to be careful about not yeah. leaving others who have such concerns about this. 
without having a voice. Mm -hmm. And we know that that particular group has had a pretty strong voice. So this does not preclude the Metro Health Department from doing what I, I spoke with Dr. Caldwell in April and May, early May, doing with regards to reaching out to different segments of the community. We had a really good conversation about reaching out to different segments of the community. He said he would follow up on that. I'm not sure if that's occurred yet, but but this is what this is what the health department does. And so we have an opportunity to tap into our folks on the front lines that have relationships in this community. We have the expertise to make sure that we get the appropriate voices to the table. So uh, we just have to, where there's a will, there's a way. Okay, well, I, I agree. We have to move to, to do this, and we all have a concern about the existing process. So mm -hmm. um, let's, let's, I'm good to go. Any more discussion around this policy? The policy is um, Metro Health Department presents data sharing protocol to advisory group that includes um, health member, board members, COB members, HRC members, and the Harry Medical College. Um, and I would say any, anyone else that seems to be appropriate. I mean, I, I think things can change. That's, I, I do share that. Is there like, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be so, to include at least. To include at least, I, I, I mean, if. I'm open. I just, I just want transparency. I want appropriate voices around the table. And I was, my goal was to, try to strike a balance, but I'm completely open to a process that makes sure that perspectives and voices are heard from our various populations and communities. Yeah. Well, I think in theory we're all agreeing here, or some of us are agreeing. It's just the wording that- I mean, I, yeah, I, I really, so I mean, I, I mean, I will say one thing, and you know, I mean, Right. It, I mean, you don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, I, I'm okay with people. I just think there needs, I think there needs to be voices from across this, this, this entire issue. If we're, if we're going to get a review of policy, mm -hmm. and I hear what you're saying, the COB has members. I don't know who the composition of COB is, but what's to say you don't have, you know, the fire chief or the, yeah. that's not one pause. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, again, Unless I need to break the tie, I'm not going to vote on yeah. this. But I'm just telling my one thing: I don't want to be make a make a, a motion and a, and a rule that becomes so exclusive of of. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I think the groups you mentioned, I agree, they yeah. should be represented. But I also don't necessarily in isolation think them in isolation. Okay. Should so let's, be, let's change the wording. Yeah. Let's change the wording. I move that the Metro Public Health Department convene a committee to approve the a, a data sharing policy. Committee members should include the Board of Health, the Community Oversight Board, Metro Human Relations Commission, the Harry Medical College, and any other representative from a group or agency that they see fit. Does that sound? And the they would be the Metro Health Department. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, Metro Health. You said. Okay. Thank you. Would you second that amendment? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. With that said, any other discussion is updated? All right. Um, I'll go for a vote. Mr. Frederick? Yes. Ms. Etherington? Yes. Um, Mrs. Franklin? Yes. Dr. Johnson? You're muted. No. Okay, and Dr. Campbell? Uh, I'll support it, yes. Okay, motion carries four to one, thank you. All right. Now, do we have to talk about a time frame for this to happen? I mean, or should that have been in the motion? I, well, I, I, my I, understanding I, of the motion, so we voted to cease and desist, Dave mm -hmm. Sherry, and before a new policy comes up, we're, we now just voted that the department needs to run it through this committee. And about, 
can of time. Before so the from, policy from goes my, into effect. From my Congress. understanding, the health department is, is they're convening the tactical team that's going to, that's moving forward with that, considering the next, they're, Metro Health Department, we are convening the tactical team that is charged with moving forward on the plans for the next policy. So it can be fit into that timeline. So there's nothing for the, for the advisory committee to meet on if they don't have the protocol. So it's the tactical team and they're gonna say, okay, this is what we're gonna do with data sharing. This is how it's gonna take place. Okay. And then you get the advisory committee to respond to that, ask questions that poke holes, and then that committee would, um, yeah. we'd only move forward if that committee gives approval to you. I get the process. I just think also we need to be really aware of, my guess is that everybody in the department is is running full tilt. And I so I guess uh, Dr. Caldwell, you should finish this. I don't want to prolong it and forever here, but. Do you see it being uh, realistic to to invite uh, persons of who really represent different communities, uh, as stated in that motion, to convene here for a discussion sometime in the next month? Do you I, think that's I'd, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to suggest that uh, first we get the report from the technical advisory team and then the board uh, can decide, you know, on, on the process moving forward. I don't think we need to be boxed in on what that process, I mean, I, the intent is to, uh, what uh, the vice chair has said, to, to get you know, the, the specifics of, of what the process is and then we can pro have a feedback plan and that, that makes sense to me. Uh, what that feedback plan looks like, I think, you know, would uh, it be important to uh, hear from as many uh, people who would like to be part of that feedback um, and to assure that there is appropriate representation and a time for that feedback to be given. Uh, uh, but I, I, you know, um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question. It did. Thank you. Okay. All right, anything else on this topic? I have uh, one question. Uh, uh, I just want a little clarification. I just, as we uh, have passed this resolution, uh, is this, this would be a question for Dr. Caldwell and uh, Dr. Wright. Is this uh, block on data sharing going to interfere with uh, uh, contact tracing and the work of the department following up uh, positive tests or collecting data from the hospitals uh, about uh, uh, metrics, who's, uh, how many people are in the hospitals and so on. What data is being restricted to who? I just wanna be clear about that. Yeah, I, it, the, the, uh, our, our contact tracing will continue. They, Concern, of course, I had and I've articulated it is that I, I think this puts people at risk and uh, who could know. And uh, uh, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic, um, and this process may take weeks or, or months. And now we're going to uh, have a situation that the, the virus could um, take hold, um, you know, let's say uh, at the jail or at a hospital that, that, I mean, my hope is it won't, but uh, this takes uh, a tool away uh, that we were using successfully, and, um, but we'll, we'll um, do our best to, uh, to, to work uh, without it temporarily, I hope. Okay. Chair, Thank you. Any other discussion Durbin. on this topic? Chair, this is Keith Durbin. Is it appropriate for me to ask a question at this point? Yes, sir, you're recognized, please. Um, I am uh, interested in kind of the direction for the technology or the technical working group. Um, technology should follow policy. And so I'm confused as to, you know, how the flow is going to be, because I've heard that the, 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 the working group should be involved with the policy group. And I'm just looking for clarity on whether we should 
cease our direction as we have it uh, going now, as I discussed earlier, waiting for the direction of the policy group or whether we should continue working kind of with an assumption that we had had previously. Can I get some clarity on that, please? My interpretation is you continue your work as, as you are doing as quickly as you can do it. Um, and, 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 the per, and then a presentation of that, uh, that whatever, however this works comes to, uh, to this group that was voted on. So, and then for some feedback. So I think this, this that's how I interpret it was, sir. I will say this, um, the, the capital group is being convened by the health department uh, under Dr. Caldwell's leadership. This does not preclude Dr. Caldwell from pulling individuals with subject matter expertise in on the front end to help develop this. So I think more minds that are asking questions at the front end, um, that's going to make it an easier lift on the tail end. So we're not prescribing um, the voices that are part of that technical group. Um, I know that you all have already met, but maybe you do go ahead and reach out to the community oversight board to ask if someone can be a thought partner. Um, so that might be helpful in terms of trying to figure out how to make this an efficient and lean process. Okay, so so I, I will just make a statement that a technology working group is working toward a very, very specific thing. Um, I'm happy to invite uh, uh, members of the community oversight board but in terms of policy, you guys are setting the policy and the policy was set prior to us um, or stated prior to us meeting in the first place. So we're looking at a very narrow lane that we are trying to accomplish. So if there is, you know, you know, policy discussions um, that come up, they they are uh, that technology working group is not the place for those discussions to happen. So which so, so that's why I'm asking the question. Keith, what, um, what would you do in the, in the, let's just say in the next three to four weeks, if you were to continue, what actions would you be taking? And I'm asking that simply to try and understand what kind of work is entailed in this and, and wanting not to have you and your team um, feeling like, are, are we doing this for nothing, you know, since you don't know what the ultimate outcome would be. But could you go forward without having a definitive um, idea so that we would then know what you all have found out in terms of time frame and all of that? I truly appreciate this discussion, and I, I am, am, am supportive of whatever the direction of the Board of Health is. Um, and, and, and so, again, technology follows policy um, and not the other way around. And right now, the, 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 the charter of this technology working group is to address a situation where, where the, the dispatch organization within DEC when there is um, uh, an incident of some sort, is able to query the health department's uh, database in a secure and auditable manner, as Dr. Jahangir mentioned earlier, and then return a yes, no answer um, to that, that first responder. Um, there is also the situation of transport, which is similar, but, but it is a separate issue we are also working on. But again, it would be handled in a, an auditable and uh, a secure manner. So in my mind, I am quite content to move forward in this uh, manner to get a, a statement of work for Motorola for that body of work and, and, and let them quote us on what that would take um, in terms of time and dollars. However, note that if the working group that you guys have just uh, are, are talking about establishing, um, should that change change and the direction of the technology based on the policy change, then we'd start that process over again. So I, I, that's why I just wanted to make sure that, that we're all on the same page 
in terms of what you want the technology working group and the timing in which you want us to, to do our work. Okay, I have a motion. Well, that might get to that. Get okay, okay. Um, does, do we have any discussion about this? Does anybody have a strong view on this? No. I, I mean, I think that makes sense. I do too. I'm, yeah. I'm really and so, wanting them to and, go and forward. And so, so what, yes, it's what's yes. missing that didn't happen earlier on is that the board didn't get a chance to yeah. even consider a plan on paper about sharing data, right? And I think we, we sort of have something now, but given the conversation and given the additional information that Dr. Caldwell gave us at the top of the meeting that wasn't in that document that we received yesterday or the day before, I, I think maybe Dr. Caldwell should go back the drawing board, just make sure to vet the process that he's proposing. Um, pull some, see what's happening in other municipalities. Um, what is the evidence base? What's worked, what hasn't worked? And bring it back to the board next month so we can approve that policy. Then that will be the go ahead for the technical team to move forward. Yeah, I would too. Well, I mean, so, or, but we still need to be able to that that because at the end of the day, if well, let me ask you a question: Why can't this group get together in the next week? Which one? This data, this group, we just and let them vet the process that's on the table. Now there is, there is a proposed process. Let that group look at that proposed process. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's fair. I think that's yeah, that's, I mean, just that's right. And, and this, we don't need to delay this because I, I I'm not supportive of delaying this months and months and then months and months subsequent to that until. Product of it. I would agree, and yeah, they've got a they've got a a, 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 yeah. a plan that they can put forward. Mm -hmm. That um, so next week, get this group together next week. Finally, would that Keith, would that work? You get a group together next week that talks about the plan that's essentially done that you're about to bid or whatever the right word is. Yeah, as long as we, I'd like to have a final kind of proposed plan to present. And again, you know, we're going to use all of next week, I think, to make sure that we've got the things, uh, uh, you know, all the, the, the T's crossed and I's dotted. And so maybe the week following, uh, early the week following, I think that would be, um, if, if we could arrange that, we'd be happy to uh, speak to what the plan is. But again, it's based on this 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 solution that we have come up with in the past based on that prior policy decision. Let me uh, make a suggestion. Um, why not take the existing uh, proposal and take it to this group as soon as possible uh, as a something we're presenting for input or vetting if there's anything that needs to be changed or altered. So we have already something in place, as opposed to trying to come up with something from scratch. Get input and uh, move on in a timely fashion. I think we're on board with that, Dr. Campbell. I think that's similar to what we're thinking here in the room. Yeah. Good, good. All right, any other discussion around this before we move to the director's report? So, so let me just summarize. I think this group, Dr. Caldwell, um, the proposal that's essentially near done to just be vetted. The draft that's in it should be just, this group should just think through it, make comments, and you bid it and go from there. I think that would make sense. Are you okay with that, Keith? Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to um, um, to discuss, to make sure, make, it's make the document available so everybody can review it. Um, oh feedback on it and if we need to iterate it again we can iterate it again I mean that's that's kind of what uh, the process is uh, anyway is making sure each individual can you know bring the technical expertise that they have to the table and their needs are met thank you so we have we, we have a plan forward good all right okay okay great um, okay, we have one more item on the agenda for this portion of the meeting, and that is the report of the director. Dr. Caldwell, you're on, and I'm wondering if you yes, could. Right. Would, you, would you do me a favor? Could you just uh, summarize what just uh, occurred? Because I, I just really want to make sure I, I understand. 
So you, there's already a, a, a technical proposal, a proposal to, that's being put forward that the technical team is responding to. So before that plan is finalized, you have an opportunity to pull in the members of the advisory committee that we just voted on to the table to vet that process early on to make sure that it's, it's to help lean the process. Let the bid, bidding go through, and at the very end, there's still an opportunity just to make sure that everything is tight. So, be, so you pull in your stakeholders, people that have expertise at the front end before you finalize uh, the bidding process. Um, and I'm okay, happy to uh, discuss this. In the interest of time, I'm happy to discuss yeah, no, no, that's one fine. Uh, Keith, I, I just, uh, Keith, uh, does that, that make sense to you too? Because I mean, I'm going to be uh, help working with you. Is that correct? Yes, I, I feel like I understand is that the technical working group is going to, to uh, uh, work through our proposal based on what we, we understand. We will then um, bring the working group that you guys have established into place and to to work through that to make sure that you're, that is acceptable. And then we will send that on only after we've met um, with the group that you just established or that you're talking about establishing. Okay. All right, great. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, you're on. In the interest of time, just keep in mind it's, it's six o'clock, it's been a very long day for Everyone, so I'll turn it over to you for your report. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, give you a, uh, I know you're getting a lot of information about uh, COVID, so just to give you uh, an overview of how we're uh, expanding our team, Dr. Wright has taken on the role as the uh, interim director for COVID response, and with that, we are hiring over 20 additional staff temporarily. Uh, those would be staff to uh, back up some of the work that he has uh, done uh, and is doing for his usual responsibilities with occupational health in the jail. Uh, but we also are hiring specific uh, support staff to assist with the growing COVID response. Uh, and that will be um, in addition to an administrative assistant, a testing coordinator, uh, a staffing coordinator, a logistics coordinator, uh, because these are important because uh, a lot of our staff who have been backfilling into the results line, the hotline and other functions uh, now are gonna need to be starting to call back to their regular duties. So we don't have as much uh, of our normal staff that can be reassigned anymore. Um, we also are focusing on vulnerable populations and we have specific staff now that we're gonna be hiring uh, for the following areas. One, specifically to help us coordinate all the work we're doing with the homeless population. Another one specifically for the uh, aged uh, population, and that person would be focused on everything regarding our work in nursing homes, assisted living, as well as for uh, the uh, healthier 65 plus group. And we have a work group that's being started with that. We also are gonna have a staff person uh, for COVID uh, specifically assigned to behavioral health. And this will be uh, working uh, in conjunction, not only uh, with Dr. Wright and the whole COVID response, however, also with Tina Lester and her group. Uh, and Mayor Cooper uh, had provided um, uh, an appearance and, and some leadership at the recent behavioral uh, wellness uh, advisory group here. And he has asked that, and I have also asked that that group come up with a a behavioral health COVID response plan uh, that we can use to help us immediately and, and moving forward. Uh, in addition to these staff, we are gonna have two specific staff for racial and ethnic diversity. One focused specifically on the African-American population, uh, which will be not just North Nashville, 
uh, how it will be focused on North Nashville, but also the broader African American population. And then an additional one for racial and health equity focused on the Hispanic and other multicultural communities that make up the Southeast Corridor and others throughout the community. So that will help to coordinate and expand a lot of the work that we're doing to focus on Southeast. In addition, we are uh, going to be hiring uh, an entire testing strike force team that we, so we will have our own. This will help us in a number of ways uh, to help expand testing throughout the county uh, and, and will complement the testing strike force team that we have had at Meharry Medical College come up with. Uh, so we will have this additional one. They will also um, providing staff for uh, our, our needs at the Department of Health, specifically uh, of the back to school immunization, which we know is going to be more challenging this year. Uh, and uh, also for the uh, needs that we have uh, at all of our buildings to be able to do the temperature testing. Uh, so we're going to have a, a back to school uh, uh, staffing increased, uh, and that's gonna be not only at Lentz, but also at Woodbine and East. Uh, and then, of course, for the temporary uh, temperature check, check staffing. So these are uh, a real augmentation of all of the work that we are doing now, uh, which as we are reopening and have reopened, uh, we have even more work to do at the Department of Health uh, on COVID. In addition, I wanted to briefly tell you that uh, you've seen that the face masks that the state of Tennessee has uh, given out have uh, been uh, reviewed by the EPA as well as the Tennessee Department of Health. And we're reviewing that and, and probably will move forward uh, early next week to restart our face mask distribution efforts. But we're gonna give time for us to review all of that information with our colleagues at Emergency Response and our team here at the Department of Health to be able to make sure we're comfortable with that, but we're likely to move in that direction. Um, I also wanted to uh, update you on the fact that you had asked previously that the Metro testing centers have a notice to provide, well, I guess now I have to change this again, because we were going to provide them notice about the, the data sharing, which now I'll have to Re revise that notice that we were going to be giving out uh, based upon the um, vote earlier today. Um, the technical advisory uh, support team on reopening is led by Mr. Tom Sharp and Mr. Hugh Atkins. Uh, they are having a call center, uh, which is uh, working. Uh, we've gotten uh, a number of complaints. Uh, Mr. Atkins, was over 500 or so? No, it's not that many, but, oh, well, yeah, there's probably that many there. But. Of, of uh, inputs from the Hub Nashville, of uh, mostly people who are not wearing a face mask uh, at, at certain uh, places where they're supposed to be, employees. Uh, and um, so we have identified about 33 sites that uh, seem to continue to be non-compliant. We're going to be going uh, to visit those sites. I'm also worked with Mr. Durbin and his team for GIS mapping so that we could overlay uh, some of the assessment data and uh, well assessments, um, the assessor's office with our heat map where we're seeing a lot of uh, activity in our community. We could focus our efforts to reach out to businesses in those specific areas in a more proactive uh, way. Um, so um, regarding racial and, and health equity, uh, in addition to what I've just brought up with COVID, at the Department of Health, uh, I've been working with Tina Lester and uh, uh, Dr. Harris, as, as well as uh, the, the other members of the team on, on racial and health equity. I've worked with uh, Dr. Um, Derek Griffith, uh, who, um, works at, at Vanderbilt as well as Dr. Hildreth, 
and I'm reviewing uh, all of the evaluations that were done toward the end of last year, as well as to see how we can start implementing some of the some of the recommendations that were put in place uh, as as quickly as we can. And I also believe that we should uh, en enhance our uh, the training of, of the staff as was uh, brought up earlier. Uh, there are um, a few uh, categorical programs I wanna make sure that you're updated on that have gotten some uh, notice. Uh, one is uh, that we've had positive West Nile virus mosquito pool uh, and we're gonna be uh, partnering uh, with uh, the Red Cross uh, and Mr. Joel Sullivan, who's the executive director of Red Cross, to uh, look at some emerging technology uh, with possibly uh, with drone mapping to look for uh, standing water in the community with areas that we know. So we're really excited about using some new technology to help us with our public health work. Um, we're also reviewing the Medical Reserve Corps program and seeing if that Medical Reserve Corps program can be uh, looked at in a, in, a, in a new way from what it had originally been uh, designed to do, focusing just on the pod program and seeing if we can get some leadership within the volunteers of the Medical Reserve Corps program to help us with some additional uh, ongoing activities throughout the department. Now, I provided you uh, my weekly update last week, and I just wanted to remind you of some of the things that I've been involved in. I participated in the uh, Minority Caucus uh, recently on, on June 1st. I uh, also helped to put together the COVID Minority Caucus webinar, which came out, which I put a link on on your um, weekly update. Uh, I also participated in a, a, a webinar with Dr. Derek Griffith for racial disparities of COVID-19. Uh, and as well as I participated in the Spanish speaking community media event that was led by Fabian Bedney also, and I'll continue to be involved uh, with that. I was really happy to have gone to the medical examiner program and gotten to know them, and still we are having tremendous uh, challenges with overdose in our community, and uh, that, that continues to be a problem. Uh, I'm really pleased overall about our partnerships with Mahari Medical College and how they've overseen now all of the assessment centers. Uh, they've been working with the churches to increase testing there as well. And the Metro Department of Housing Authority testing, I think, uh, uh, was overall well received in the end. I've completed my public health accreditation board training and uh, want to inform you of two uh, specific areas of focus that I am going to be uh, working on now with the organization of the department uh, on, on, a, on an immediate basis. That will be the recognition that uh, I, I want to focus on the uh, strategic plan of the department. Now that uh, ends at the end of this year and uh, I realize that this is gonna give me the opportunity to uh, incorporate my vision and plan for accomplishing um, specific objectives over the, the next two years. And I'm you know, still getting to know the department, the employees and the community. And I feel now that I have uh, the opportunities to be able to set a, a vision and to have a, a process for engagement of, of stakeholders uh, in addition to the employees. And uh, I think what I've identified are two specific components. One is to create a specific uh, unit and division that will house uh, the accreditation and strategic planning uh, process. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bailey is uh, assisting me with that. It's gonna be focus on the FAB program for quality uh, oversight and performance measures, and it's gonna be all focused on helping to measure our success uh, as a department. And my three overarching goals uh, are gonna to be to increase the department's visibility and value to the entire metropolitan community, to assure the infrastructure for the department and assure our public health activities are, 
are strong and, and continue to expand and then uh, to focus on our continued role in emergency preparedness. So with that specific focus unit on accreditation and quality and oversight and performance improvement and program development, I've recognized that our epidemiological uh, staff is quite widely distributed in so many categorical programs. And uh, it's uh, important that we have a unification of our epidemiological uh, and data center to really think of the Department of Health as having a, a nerve center of data. So I'm, I'm looking uh, to create uh, a, a unit uh, of the uh, epidemiological uh, staff and, and team specifically uh, to accomplish that. Uh, and um, I'll be uh, hopefully by the next uh, meeting be able to provide more specifics on that. But right now, uh, these are the two areas that I'm gonna focus on for the organizational uh, changes within the department. Uh, see if I, I'm gonna uh, stop there and I'm looking, that was about a 10 minute presentation and I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. So I'd like to open it up for questions. <laughs> I, I, there's one other uh, item of really importance, uh, uh, which is we launched uh, a new initiative called Musicians for Smoke-Free Nashville um, uh, with our uh, tobacco control program, as well as the Americans for Non-Smokers Rights Foundation. And uh, we're really looking forward uh, to using this time of COVID to take advantage of that. So that was another uh, major, oh, and I just got off the, uh, an email here that there's been an introduction in the Metro Council uh, to um, uh, possibly uh, to, to create smoke-free uh, parks. So I know that uh, Mr. Smith and I are looking at that. That's sponsored by council members Rosenberg, Kurt, and Bradford. So just along tobacco, which is still the number one cause of preventable disease. And I think with COVID, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we can take advantage of this time to get people uh, to quit and to not start smoking. And I included in public health order number six, specifically that any facility that's opening, they should not allow, they should um, not have uh, smoking uh, within their facility. So that we're using that as an educational tool as well. Thank you. I know we have questions. Let's just chip away at them. Go ahead. Um, do you want to, uh, Dr. Johnson? Would you or in Dr. Campbell? Are there questions that you all have? Uh, wow, so much information. I'm not sure I have processed it enough to have a question at the moment. Dr. Johnson. You're on mute. There you go. Um, I'll probably have questions that I would like to direct to you or another member of the board later since I'm rolling off. But, um, I thought that was a very uh, good comprehensive presentation and it clarified some questions I had. Right. I do have questions and, and this, um, my first question, the staffing that you mentioned, individuals coming on board, particularly uh, to work with individuals living with homelessness um, are uh, around aging, behavioral health, and uh, racial and ethnic diversity, so forth and so on. Are those permanent positions or are they temporary positions? Right now, the CARES Act funding provides us to only hire temporary staffing for COVID, but we do expect the temporary to be uh, long-lasting okay yeah, great. At, at, and just, at, the, at this point and, and and great and just to to caution you um something just to keep in mind even though you have point individuals for these particular populations it's still the work of the health department to focus on everyone um, so just keep in mind to make sure that it's integrated so focusing on that black community isn't the responsibility of one person 
for instance, it really is the responsibility of the entire department. And I just want, for our audience, I just want to make sure that people are, understand that that's how we do public health. But I, I appreciate the diligence in which you're mapping out. And, and I'd like to clarify, that's really just as a coordinator, to coordinate and not to, you know, Okay, just great. to help us, and, and with all of these, obviously, I, I agree uh, with with your uh, thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I don't really have any questions. I have so many questions. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even want to start. Yeah, I, think I, really need it. I, I One question I have for all of us is um, the partnerships that we've been engaged with. Uh, I would really <clears throat> like to sometime hear, and I know that we've got so much stuff on our agenda every month, but I, I would really like to try and start getting back to having <clears throat> some brief presentations to us, and I think these partnerships are so important um, that I'd like to, to uh, sort of promote the idea of having one of these partner people speak to us, and I have a bias about who. <laughs> and and uh, it's because uh, Amy Richardson, who's with Salome, was here in the department spending many, many hours training the community health workers who are working with that community. And I think she could articulate for us um, what the challenges are in trying to get out in the southeast corridor mm -hmm. and deal with this population. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to put out the prospect um, of her having some time on the next I think, meeting. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I think that would be excellent. We have the data, but we don't have the stories behind the exactly. data. Exactly, and I think it would really be helpful for us to better understand how the department is engaging with their partners and what's, what's working well, what are the things that need to get streamlined. Yes, I, I, I will invite her to the next meeting and I, I think that will also help us uh, focus more on, on the biggest area of concern, which is the Southeast Nashville public and the work they're doing. So, And I was really pleased to have been here the day that she trained. I trained this, uh, those new community health workers and I got to meet all of them during that training. Yes, it meant a lot to them that you were here and that you spoke to them, yeah. Just one uh, question. Uh, I noticed Dr. Carl was talking about the visiting the medical examiners and the way overdoses, uh, that's kind of gotten uh, fallen into the background with all the uh, emphasis on COVID. I'm concerned that uh, uh, I just hope we're, we don't lose the focus about how important it is to stay on top of this fentanyl uh, epidemic and um, wondering and somewhere down the line if we can facilitate some more coordination with some academic centers uh, like with uh, Vanderbilt around working around some of this uh, uh, drug treatment things that uh, may be more uh, effective in terms of community interventions and so forth. There should be some mutual benefit between the two groups at some point in time. Same to me. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Behavioral Health Wellness Advisory Committee is putting together a uh, comprehensive sort of COVID response plan that will also include the, the overdoses. Uh, and I do like to also say that Mayor Cooper has uh, at least twice during his press conferences highlighted his concern about the rise in the overdose deaths and as people had representatives speak about it and, and promoting the red line. Uh, but, but you're right, um, it, it, is, uh, it is something we still need to pay more attention to and that's why I'm really glad that we do have the Behavioral Wellness Advisory Committee and that we have the opportunity to, to uh, really do something here. Uh, and, and we will not forget about how important that is. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for your report. Um, if, if we do have questions that come up, then we can email them to you and, and we'll follow up accordingly. Um, would you like to resume? Sure, okay. thank you. Um, 
And no questions here. I think the, we had one topic of follow-up for the board for sure, wasn't it? To, or Dr. Not, Paul was going to invite. Um, right, and then and then we're going to get answers around. To who did the training for? Yeah, who did the training for police? So those are two, Martha. Those are two requests of the um, that follow up in in a short time order. So thank you. So I will adjourn this meeting. Open up the civil service meeting. Um, Mr. Diamond, you got two topics to press on. Yes, Director Jahangir. Uh, last month we talked about the department needing to uh, put a hazardous uh, pay policy in place. And uh, Les Bowern, our, our human resources director, and I, along with uh, Metro HR, uh, came up uh, with the draft that was included in your in your packet. Um, so I, I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have or uh, any concerns. Any thoughts? Hang on one second. Yes, of course. Got the dog. Um, can we just um, can we just revisit? Who among us in the MPHD is is um, getting a hazardous duty compensation? Is anyone in the department qualified for hazard pay currently? I think the answer is no, but let me double check. Currently, the answer is no. The the CARES Act fund. Funding uh, stated that uh, the policy had to be in place prior to the uh, event starting, which we did not. And uh, it was also restrictive to people who had repeated face-to-face -face interaction with uh, anybody who are COVID po positive or possibly COVID positive. And we really don't have uh, a lot in, uh, who, who would qualify in that way. But uh, we did want to have a policy in place in the future if anything uh, came up or if the uh, definitions of the CARES Act funding did change that would allow our employees to, to qualify. This is consistent with Metro, with Metro's room for everyone else that felt it was important our department had that in place as well. Oh, that's correct. Motion for approval of Mr. Frederick. Second. Second for Ms. Essington. All in favor, and you can thumbs up on the screen. Great. Anyone opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Next step, please. Uh, the last item of the Civil Service Board is the personnel changes that were included in your packet, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have about that. We do not need uh, approval uh, for, of these. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, hearing nothing else, I adjourned this meeting. I'm grateful to everyone for everything you guys do. And Dr. Johnson, truly, our, my sincerest gratitude to you for your five years of service. We're Thank toasting you. to you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Meetings adjourned.